It's Thursday. That's that six. means so we're here. Facebook Live. This is becoming a regular thing. I'm very happy that yeah. you're here. I stopped fixing my bicycle. Yes. Um, we went for an adventuresome bicycle ride. One thing you should know about Herman is that he loves to go off, off trail. trail scrambles. I like, love the off trail scramble. We cannot go on a hike or a bike ride and stay on the trail. Like that is just not allowed. And especially when you're riding bicycles and you end up like carrying your bicycle up the hill, like on a ravine, I just, yeah. That's fun. It's fun. But here's the ironic thing. When you're in the arena, you like follow the beaten path and you like cannot venture out of your path. But when we go hiking. Off trail scramble. Why it's is a balance. that? It's I don't understand. Balance. It's a balance. <laughs> I don't get it. It's a balance. Anyways, he got a flat tire. Two oh. of them. Four of them. I got two of them at Galway <laughs> at the show. I ran through a bunch of uh, uh, goat heads. Yeah. And then when I went to change the inner tubes, I ran my fingers all through the inside and I didn't feel anything sharp. So I was like, I was okay, but they were all stuck in the tire. And then when I pedaled again, it yeah. stuffed them back into the inner tube and and then we had to jump the fence with the bicycles. So Twice. that was exciting. We had to jump the fence to the wash and then go down the path. And then I was getting the flat tire. And then we had to jump yeah. the fence back into the compound. Anyways, it was raining and we didn't get to ride our horses. Well, we just were able to tack walk around the property. So clearly we had way too much time. Clearly. Clearly. And we're both going stir crazy. Are but tomorrow we can ride. Nobody's nobody's lying. Behind. There's lots of people. There's 36 people watching. What There's do you mean? No Say comment. hello in the chat because he's not feeling. I'm the not. Love. I'm not seeing. Let us know comment. if you have any questions for us. Okay. Okay. So next week, Tuesday. next Thursday, we're going to be at World Cup, which I'm very excited about. Um, there's some really good horses, some really good riders. I'm so excited to see them. I'm excited to see Delara and Jessica. They are the defending champions. Are you excited? They're going to win again. So a lot of people say hello. Oh, Kareem good. I feel hello. better now. because Juliet, like... Lori, okay. Okay. he was not feeling the love. Um, so Delara and Jessica, I think they will probably more than likely win. But one thing that I love, like, and one thing that I'm really going to do at World Cup is try to really focus on not just watching the horses, but also really focusing on the riders and what they're doing with their bodies, what their position is like, what their seat is doing, what their hands are doing, what their legs are doing, because that's really inspirational and really educational. So... Yeah, because it's so subtle and it's the right tiny amount at the right time. And then there's nothing. And then there's the right little bit at the right time. And then. Yeah. I mean, it looks like they're doing nothing because their aids are so invisible and the horses are so fine tuned. But if you really watch and train your eye, you can. You'll see what they're doing. Yeah, you can see the aids and you can see how precise they are, you know, how precise their leg positioning is. And. That's what it takes to perform at that level. So we are we also people are going to see us next. Yes. Yeah, so meet, we're meeting Sherry. People. We're looking forward to seeing you. So in Omaha, Wednesday is the Grand Prix. Thursday morning, we are going to be doing a live seminar on rider position, which is going to be awesome. We're getting a saddle rack sent to us and a saddle so that we can sit some of you guys in the saddle and. That's going to Omaha? I thought that was going to Sacramento. No, it's going to Omaha. So you have to assemble it. And um, and then we'll have a, a stand for you guys to sit on. We'll play around with your position. We're working on getting some guest appearances, which may or may not happen. So, And then we'll do a little Q&A. So be thinking about if you have any burning questions that you want to ask us in person. The live event is going to be at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Omaha. And it's like open to anyone. So you can just come. I guess you just go to the reception and be like, or to the main thing and be like, hey, we're here for Amelia's talk. And I think Joellen's organizing it. I think there's like 200 people could be in the room. So we'll have plenty of space, I think. And yes. Yeah, yeah. I want to watch Ingrid as well. And yeah. are all the highest level horses hot? Pretty much. Yeah. There's, you need fire to go. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you need to be able to do the Grand Prix. They have to be very hot. You're not allowed to carry a whip at that level of competition. And, you know, the Grand Prix is a long test and it requires a lot of strength and a lot of stamina. And so, yes, pretty much all the horses are hot or they've trained to be. Because I do think that horses' temperaments, like some are hotter than others, but part of it's the training. Like you can dull a horse down. Right. Or you can, you can make them, them more up. sensitive. You can make them hotter to your leg. But yeah, I mean, you need you need a horse that's going forward. Yes. So that will be really fun. And um, okay, Kareen has a question for us. Where are we? I need to learn how to bring my horse from canter to trot without feeling like I am out of control. I know half halt, but not doing something right. Okay, canter trot transition. What are your tips? Um, I really like to breathe into that downward transition so I can use my weight so I really can connect myself and convince the horse that I really do want to trot because I changed my seat from my canter seat to my trotting seat. Yeah. But I'm not sure what the out of control part is. Well, I think the out of control part is you want to be trotting and your horse is still cantering, right? So. Or you're hitting the trot at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So another thing that really that helps balance um, is to do it on a circle or to like spiral in. Because any time that your horse is like going too forward or they're running away with you, if you turn them, it's going to help to get your horse to control and come back to you. So like for the canter trot transition, spiral your circle smaller until your horse trots. Like maybe don't even try pulling back or asking for trot. Just right. Make... You just In a friendly way, you make the circle so small, it's difficult to canter and then they trot because it's too much work. Yeah. So that works also. Um, but yeah. And then just remember too, that when you're half halting, you should never just be pulling like a half halt is not just pulling half halts are intermittent. Uh, part of a half halt is the release. Yes. That is the, probably the most important part of the half halt is the release of it. Yeah. And it's part of it. It isn't separate from the whole half halting part. It's. And you always half out on the upbeat. So you always half out when the mane is flying up. That's really important as well. Because if you half out, like the mechanics of the canter, right? Are your horse's back is like a wave. There it goes up, it's level, and it's down. So if you half out on the downbeat, your horse is going to go on the forehand and they're going to feel really heavy. If you half out on the upbeat, it's going to put them more on the hind end. So I hope that helps you. Okay, let's see. Someone else has a question. Do you have advice on how to help a horse that is struggling to keep his head to the inside and instead is overbending to the outside, even with the inside rein? Okay, so her horse is counterbending and she can't get her horse to bend to the inside. That's actually a really good question, I think. Uh, and my first thought is, how old is he? How long did you have him? Who did you get him from? Because my... My for gut feeling there is that he got trained to go counter bent, that he'll bend. Or he's just not stiff or, he's or uneducated. Stiff and uneducated in either or you're scenario, not asking right. <laughs> in, area, in either scenario, you need to give a little with that outside rein, give him room on the outside with the inside rein, position him to the inside, and then ride that leg yield and move him into your yeah. outside rein. So that's so what I would say. Part of it is, is positioning his head, and then the other part is riding the body to the contact. Yeah. I think that your leg, I would start with your leg because you always have to start bend, always is starch from your inside leg. And so you need to kind of push your whole horse's body over into that outside rein. Like Herman was saying, like leg yield them out. And then once they're moving out, then you can use your inside rein to get them to look a little bit to the inside. But if your horse is counter bent, remember that bend has to do with the whole body of the horse and not just by pulling on the inside rein. And that's a mistake I think we all make as we think, oh, bend our horses and we just pull on the inside rein when you need to start it from your inside leg. Right, it, the bend doesn't come from your inside rein, but it sure helps because you can position that horse, right? You get the middle of the neck to bulge outward and then it's easier to get your inside leg to move their barrel over. 
Oh, here's a good question from Julia. I'd love to know more about your warm-up routines and processes with your horses. I'm always looking for new ideas. So if I have a horse that's super hot, um, I will do the same thing every day so that that horse doesn't have any surprises. And it doesn't matter. I'll go do three circles at the walk, at the trot, at the canter, change direction, do it again. But whatever, those hot horses, I do the same thing every day, no surprises. Um, and then I like serpentines a lot for like a horse that I've not, like just a normal thing that's like, hey, we're gonna warm up. Um, my leg yield back and forth at the walk and then I do serpentines at the trot and maybe a little leg yield at the trot. Yeah. When that's feeling all balanced, then I'll start the canter. Yeah, I, I agree. I think every horse is a little bit different as far as their warm up routine. With a young horse or a green horse, we both do groundwork or lunging. You have a young horse, so you lunge every day first because they just might need that to get their energy out, to get loose and on the aids. Um, with an older horse, a lot of walking time is very important just to get them like limbered up and to let them start moving. So taking some laps around the property. And then like Herman said, a hot horse, you want to follow routine, a lazy horse, more transitions. And, you know, just the warm up is really about focusing on the basics, the base of the training scale. So rhythm, suppleness and contact. That's what you're trying to accomplish in the warm up. And sometimes it takes a whole ride to get there. So that's like yeah. the warm up. I think that's important to note, too, that the warm up takes different amounts of time every day. Like if it's Monday and your horse has held the whole weekend off, it might, the warm up might be 30 minutes and then you might only get to like, quote unquote, work on the movements or whatever for 15 minutes. But it's important to have that flexibility when you're riding and to know that the warm up and the basics really are the most important thing. And the movements will be easier once you get that. Um, okay, we'll ask answer Alita. The off the track thoroughbred I ride is having trouble lowering his head in a stretch trot. He does pretty well in his free walk. Any suggestions? Uh, maybe he's a little out of balance. He's too hurried, too fast, so he can't lower his head. So think maybe underpace a little slow and see if you can't get him to lower his neck um, there. Yeah. And if yeah, not, just um, descending and ascending circles. Yeah, spiraling in and out. And just really re like supporting. I think the biggest mistake I see riders make when they go to do the stretch circle is that they just like throw the horse away right. and tip it's forward. Still with contact. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to kind of like feed the reins out and bend and check in with your horse. And you have to really stay true in your position. Like keep your core tight, ask your horse to look a little to the inside, move them over, soften the reins. If they pop up, ask again. The other thing that you might try is if your horse stretches down in the walk, try kind of getting a stretch in the walk and then picking up the trot. Right, asking for the trot from that position already. Yeah, because, you know, I think sometimes when you're riding, you have to be creative and help your horse put the dots together. And so it's like, okay, if, if you can get him to stretch down in the, in the walk, then could you just trick him and be like, okay, keep your head there, but now let's trot. And often again, in the trot to do a stretch, it requires your horse to be balanced and to really use their core. So that's why it's a difficult movement for horses. Okay. Um, let's see. Pippa, my horse is coming back from being off. He's was very heavy on the forehand. What would you recommend to help get more on the hind legs? He's coming back what? From being off. So he's 100% he's good to go. Yeah, um, I'm assuming. Transitions within the gate. Yeah. And if you're not successful, if you find too much weight when you're trying that, then all the transitions out of the gate, but you can do it within the gate. Yeah, so transitions within the gate, halts, Rain backs. Oh, yeah, rain backs are great. Um, focusing on your position and yeah, all that stuff will help you. Okay, Chantel, I just finished Major Anders' training book. Do you or your hubby have any recommendations? It's such a good book. I was just referencing, referencing it 
for a presentation that I'm doing for Strides next week on patterns and figures. But he has so many. This is a really good book. It's like a really good resource. You can go and learn some patterns and try them out. I think it's a good book. What other yeah, books? King of the Cones. Um, Pajaski's book. Pajaski's book is good. I like Sally Swift. But I think that's I've been focusing so much on rider position because in May we're doing a rider position challenge. And so we've been putting together like all the content, the PDF, a ton of videos for you guys. And it's going to be it's going to be really good. I think for sure rider position is probably the number one thing that you can focus on and really improve your riding substantially. That's my opinion. Uh, Pajaski's book is The Complete Training of Horse and Rider. Pajaski, The Complete Training of Horse and Rider. We probably have it somewhere in our library That's over there. Fair. Okay. Next question is from Nicole. I have trouble with cantering an old, lazy school horse. I can't get asked her to pick up the canter at all except when going up a hill on a trail. I even come in with my whip and all he does is extend the trot. What should I do? Thanks. Oh, uh, yes. The school horses, they're fun. Uh, <laughs> they're just like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You so, have to be like determined. And you need to keep a contact. So he's feeling the driving aid. So he's going faster in the trot. So he's feeling the driving aid. Uh, and I've explained it to people like this sometimes. It's like jumping right? You've got to jump into the canner. So you hold the reins, you keep the contact and you jump up into the canner because if you just let the reins go and add leg, they're going to go faster. And yeah, use the whip with your outside leg. Keep the whip on the outside, not the inside. Um, can for the canner to part, that's a little more useful. Good suggestion. That's my thought on that. Okay. Here's a good question from Janice. I want to take my sensitive, reactive, spooky eight-year-old horse to his first show this summer, but I think he's going to need some preparation first. What are your best tips for getting a horse prepared and acclimated for success at their first shows? I'm not a professional, and I'm terrified that it may be a disaster. First, remember, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> And even if it's a disaster, it's still it's a good still day. <laughs> it's still a day with your horse. No matter at the end of it, when you go home, uh, you got to spend the day with your horse. And so whatever <laughs> about the show, man, you, that is a mental state. So that's my my first <laughs> my first thought is that, that no matter how it goes, it's still fun. Yeah. And then <clears throat> you just watch him, you know, read the body language. And uh, if he's on high alert, you know, you make turn on the forehand from the ground before you give yourself a lot of time. I always give myself a lot of time. Um, and you watch the body language and, you know, if he's yeah. a little high alert, some groundwork and then maybe some lunging and then you get on and remember, you don't even have to do the test. Yeah. You yeah. can just do the warm up, see yeah. the other horses. If it's good at that point, you could take him home then. Yeah. No pressure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really a good advice. And that's something that I do um, too, is I give myself an out. So I did this actually last year when I took Luigi, my six-year-old, he was six last year. I took him to his first show and I had no idea what he was going to be like at the horse show. And so I went there the first day. I had plenty of time. I lunged him first. I hand walked him all around the property. I really recommend getting a stall at the show and just hanging out for the weekend so that it kind of becomes their home. And then that way you can get up early and hand walk them around the property and lunge them in the morning and put them away, like getting them out several times. And then like her mom said, and I did this with Luigi too. I was like, well, I have no idea how he's going to be. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to ride him. I'm going to see how it is. And if all I do is school him, or if all you do is hand walk your horse around the property, that's a step in the right direction. So don't be realistic. I think people think that they're going to go to the show, their horse's first show, and everything's going to be perfect. And it's not. And you guys see that even with the top horses. Like, I'm sure we'll see that in World Cup. There's always some there, oops. There's going to be a horse there's that, be some oops. Right, that spooks or they have a mistake. and or the, or the rider forgets their test. Or Yeah. I mean, it happens. 
And you have to give yourself that grace and, and take it always as a schooling or like Herman said, it's like, we're here to have fun. We're here to enjoy our horses. And so I think that that's really important to just be realistic and try to give your horse a good experience, a good positive experience it's not about the score. It's not about being perfect. Well, even Carl Hester says it's just dressage. It's yeah. just dressage. You yeah, know. Yes. Yeah. And you can just go in school and have fun. Okay. Next question is from Amy. So Amy is working on her sitting trot. She says, my coach says I need to sit lighter. I'm working on my own fitness, strength, in addition to cardio. What is involved in sitting lighter? My coach has helped me to learn not to grip with my knees, to engage my core, and to have my hands forward. Now I'm trying to understand how to sit lighter. Any analogies or references to what body parts to engage or disengage would be great. I'm back to my breathing. So even in just sitting in your chair, right? We can do this all together now. If you breathe deep, you can raise your center of gravity. You keep your posture, you exhale, you feel yourself lower. When you do that on the horse, you're trying to feel your weight get down into the middle of your horse and then be flexible. Yes, be flexible. That's if you're stiff, if you're hard, then you're banging and that's that's not comfortable for you or them. So you do the breathing because that'll adjust the, your center of gravity, but you, fluidity is the key. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And there's like, so you want to sit in the saddle. Like when you're, you, you have you're to connected. have. Right. For sure you're connected. There has to be weight in the saddle. And generally kind of my general rule of thumb is that the weight of your torso should go into your seat bones and the weight of your legs should go into your stirrups. That's kind of how I break it down. If you put too much weight in your stirrups, you're like jamming your feet forward and that's going to lighten your seat, but you don't want to do. But now you're forced and things right. are going to be hard and stiff. and Right. So you don't want to stand up out of the saddle to sit the trot, but you do really want to follow and absorb that motion of your horse. And like Herman said, that flexibility so that in the trot, your horse's back goes up and down, kind of like a trampoline. And in your hips. You're kind of. And, straight and up and straight yeah. and up and straight and up. Yeah. So your hips have to undulate and take up that motion when your horse's back is coming up. So I, I used to ride with this German guy and he said one time, I don't know. He said, don't sit angry in the saddle, which I thought was like, it made a lot of sense because you know how sometimes like if you're like trying to like, make it happen make it happen yeah exactly like if you're trying to drive your horse into something or if you're trying to really make them stop and you just like push your seat and your back into the saddle you don't want to do that that and that's what he meant by don't sit angry in the saddle like don't block your horse in that way with your seat so um so yeah i think breathing is really good and then i think also for the sitting trot and one thing that I learned a lot from Stephanie, the physical therapist I work with, is as far as putting your legs on, really think about using your outer, like your outer butt muscles, basically to drape your legs around the horse. And that's how you keep your position and how you keep your legs on without gripping. Yeah, you gotta okay. hug them with your legs. Okay, we have six minutes left. Okay. You're gonna tell a story. About what? About your horse Q. Um Q. What, the what first I, one. About how I got he's had Q two horses named Q. I had Q and the new Yes. Q, so I want you to tell the story because I think it's like just a really good story about overcoming challenges with horses. Oh, so I got Q for free from Germany for the airfare. And um and my first day with him, all right, so the barn I was, there was a hill that went up from my barn, up the little hill, then the path to the barn. And how old are you when you got him? 35. So you thought you were just bulletproof. And why did you get him for free? Uh, he was 
killing people. <laughs> Did he really kill people? No, but he was 17. Well, you wrote him. He was 17 too. What was he doing to people that that required that you got him for free? <clears throat> He'd break in half and gallop off and stick his head in the air and look at the stars and run as fast as he could go until he hit something. And you went down or he went down or something. It was exciting. It was and exciting. So did they tell you that? Um, no, they just said I could have him for airfare because he was dangerous and nobody wanted him. Okay. So I paid, okay. For, his, I paid for his ticket and he comes. And you don't do any groundwork or like anything. You're just like, I'm and just going to get on. I got on. Okay. And we go walking up the hill and he's all good. He was good when I got on. I mean, what was he? Seven at the time or nine? Yeah. Seven. Okay. Seven. So, you know, we go walking up the hill. We turn, he sees the covered arena and the other horses in it. He does a 180 on the hill, leaps into the air, hits the ground, full gallop, downhill with his head in the sky, just as fast as he could go. Now, it wouldn't have been so bad, except that he didn't see the wash rack that he was running right for. So weird. Like, why wouldn't he look where he was Because his head is in the air. He just won't take the contact at all. You could not touch his mouth. You took the reins up, you flipped his head, and he took off. So I dismount from the full gallop, holding the reins. I run alongside him, go past that, and that was my first day with Q. And then what did you do? Then we lunged, and then we really slowed it down. And uh, for about 30 days, uh, I put him in the jump saddle. And I went down to the lower arena that was huge. And I just got up in a two-point position and we just cantered every day until he finally didn't touch went. I didn't, I just took the slack out of the reins and he cantered and he cantered and he cantered, but he never went to my hand. He was never as fast as we were, we were never forward. Because he wouldn't come through into the bridle. And but and why was that? Because people I don't know. I didn't, I wasn't there. Right, but you can what hypothesize. They, uh, they scared the hell out of him. That's that's all yeah. I can guess. So maybe at. they like confined him and never it was let just all him. Force. Move? I mean, whatever they did, they just tried to force him. Would be my best guess. Was he afraid of like you on his back, or was he afraid the contact? Of the, the contact, contact and you couldn't put your leg on. You couldn't touch the reins without him just having a, a nuclear reaction. Yeah. And so we cantered every day in that lower arena and uh, and I just waited and I just waited. And finally he came over his back and threw and was in my hand and um, and you got your silver medal on. How long did that take you? Which the cantering around every yeah, day? Yeah, like until you could that get him. That was a month. That a was month. a month of So milk. that's not, I mean, really that's not bad. But I thought it was gonna go faster with, um, with Frankie because of that. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, no, he ran like that for about a month. And then I could just start to touch the reins and he wouldn't freak out. And then slowly, slowly, I just started building on that. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, when horses, sensitive horses, when they have a bad start and when something like bad happens like that at the beginning, it can really freak them out. And just, you know, and I, I think my guess is that Q, I think if he'd have been started differently, like if you'd had him right. from the beginning, and somebody he here wouldn't asked, have done no, that. No, no, he wasn't in pain. We did all the checks and everything. It was yeah. all emotional. It was just all emotional. Yeah. And then he was a cool horse because you you got him up to the Grand Prix. He was my Grand Prix horse. Yeah. So, yes. so Herman got him up to the Grand Prix, and then he was actually the first horse that I did the FEI on. And that yeah, was Because you cool. got your silver medal on him. Yeah. yeah Herman gave him to me in like for two weeks. And then I went out and did the pre St. George on him, which was really cool. And, um, there was only one moment of yelling where you made me cry. <laughs> this was like at the beginning of our relationship. So, so yeah, he was like, ago. he was like, here, take my horse and, um, go and do the pre St. George. And then he was like teaching me every day and he started yelling at me. and It didn't go very well definitely a pivotal moment in our relationship <laughs> i was like you can't yell at me like that's not going to work um so, but it was, i mean he was traumatized so there's i mean the horse had been traumatized and we just brought him 
we, we th me, my trainers, right? The people who helped me, we just brought him to a better place. You know, yeah. he something had happened to him. Yeah, but I mean, I think that stories like that are important because horses, they do heal and you can't overcome it. But it really requires being like, like Herman, like being brave, being consistent, being determined. And there's kind of this fine line, which I'm sure you felt with Q is, you know, when you're riding, you have to be the leader and you have to be in charge. But there's also times when your horse is really freaked out that you, you, you have push. to, right. You have to go. Like I used to work for a cowboy. He said, you have to go with them so that then they can go with you. And that's the scary part, you know, and it's not for everyone. I, you know, I used to start a lot of young horses and I don't do it as much anymore. And so it's something that I think when you're in a situation like that and you have a young horse or you have a horse that's scared or like over mounted, something like that, you have to put it with some, you have to be really selective and put it with a person that can help the horse through that. Like I heard a great analogy once about like confidence buckets, basically. And if you think about it, the more confidence that you have as a rider, you can ride a horse that doesn't have any confidence. So like you're a very confident rider. You were able to help Q because you had confidence when he didn't have any confidence. However, if you're a rider that has no confidence, Q's not your horse. Right. You cannot <laughs> ride a horse that doesn't have Because it has to start with you. Right. It has to start with you. So if you're a rider that struggles with confidence, it's very, very important that you find a confident, well-trained, older horse that can help you to give you that confidence. So anyways, that's our spiel for tonight. So, We're going to... Well, thank you for listening to my story. I didn't... No, you need to share more stories. We like to hear your stories. Okay. Let us know in the chat if you liked Q's story. Q was a really cool horse. He was a special horse. And I think it's it's also really cool when you overcome something like that. With he was horse. very cool. You know, like that no one else could, even in Germany, because in Germany, you know, I mean, they know how to ride. And the fact that they just gave him away and then you were able to take him and get him all the way up to the Grand Prix. See, they all like your story. They say, thank you. Good story. Yeah. So I don't we'll know. have to I don't... tell you more stories. Okay. Yes. We'll but sure. it was a cool horse and he was, yeah, he was talented and he ended up doing everything. And it just goes to show you that it, you know, it wasn't that he was in pain or he was unwilling any of that. It was just that they couldn't communicate with him and they couldn't give him confidence. So, yeah. yeah. And, and then he was just like my dog. <laughs> he was kind of grumpy. <laughs> right. He was, but he was like my dog, right? Remember the bridling thing? Yeah. The bridling. Now that's a funny story. Tell them the bridling right, we'll story. The bridling story. So he put his head up and I'm tall. So he they were like an head. old married couple. Right. So he puts his head up and I'm like, whatever. I got to reach nine feet in here and I get the <laughs> bridle on. And, uh, and then I was like, what is that? <laughs> Cause I didn't care. So anyway, I went away to teach a clinic and I come back and, uh, you know, maybe had him for the weekend and I get home and he's putting his head down to his <laughs> knees when she puts the bridle on and she calls my attention. She goes, see, and puts the bridle on with his head down between his knees. It was just a funny day. Horses. It was a funny day. But that is one thing that, that horses are so amazing is because you can change them. Like horses are way easier to train than people. And they're so much more honest and responsive and just, you know. In that yeah, way. that's and that's really why because they're just they don't lie, cheat, or steal. They're not trying to get over, so that makes yeah. it easier. Yeah. Anyways, we'll see you guys next Thursday. I guess we'll be at the World Cup. We'll see you guys. We'll try to, uh, yeah, we'll try to do something. Levi won't be there. Very sad, but hope you guys all have a wonderful.